And while you guys are doing that, I'll actually give um, Professor Gerada um, and Professor Dong a chance to introduce themselves. So, Linda. Oh, hi guys. Um, so my group is uh, biology students and we've been working on CRISPR strategies for various things this summer. Um, so gene editing. Nice, and Professor Dong? All right, hi everybody. Um, Professor Dong here. So I am teaching the combinatorial game theory class and uh, um, the students in my class are analyzing this game called Pylos. Awesome. And I see some of you guys are figuring out how exactly to describe your research in the chat. Just like, <laughs> all right, awesome. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Phoenix. Thank you, Inji. Excellent. Nice. So, as I mentioned before, before some of you guys were on, um, we can, but we do not plan on you guys doing any kind of presenting of your own personal material today, though you totally can. Um, but we'll definitely be doing some exercises and we'll kind of give you some material to use for those exercises. Um, so we will, um, oh, perfect, awesome. Thanks for joining us, David. So we'll go ahead and get started. We're gonna talk about just in general, just presenting at a STEM conference later this summer. So within your guys' respective classes, you guys might be joining a virtual presentation next week. Um, in the fall, we do plan on having an in-person live presentation. Depending on if you want to continue your research, you may be presenting this particular research at a conference. And if not, in the future, if you stay in STEM, you're probably going to be presenting at a conference at some point or another. So for today, kind of our goal is, first off, like, why would you attend an academic conference? Like, what's the purpose of these conferences? Uh, we'll talk about the two typical types of conference formats that you will likely present in um, in the relatively near future. Uh, we'll look at a presentation example for you guys to kind of identify some strengths and weaknesses of it. And then we'll also do a couple, um, a small kind of speaking activity for you guys to kind of feel more confident um, with speaking. Um, so, Professor Banks, if you want, you can take over. Yeah, absolutely. So, you guys are all preparing for an academic conference, and if you have never been to one before, or maybe you just heard about it, it could seem like something that is totally out of your realm, and perhaps you're not quite sure what to expect. Um, and that's okay. So, when you think about going to an academic uh, conference, Think about it as an opportunity for you as a student researcher to have a platform to showcase your research, to share with others who may also be students, who could also be faculty, practitioners, researchers in similar related fields of interest. So this is, um, it really is, uh, I would say a great opportunity to uh, connect with other individuals who are interested in your topic, but also um, use that opportunity as a chance to network and build relationships with others so that you can potentially harness those relationships to extend and continue your research. You can also use the academic conference as an opportunity just to find out what others are studying, what they're researching and, and learn from them. So you can get a different perspective of the various approaches um, that others might be employing in their scholarship. So it can be a ton of fun to go to a conference if back in the day when they used to print old uh, conference schedules, they would be like thick booklets that you could skim through to see and view um, the various presentations going on throughout the day. Nowadays, you go online and you can sort of scroll through and identify the kinds of talks that you might want to listen to, presentations, workshops. Um, and so it's, it's really, you can make that event what you want it to be. And there are no... So Oh, sorry. Go, sorry ahead. go ahead. No, no go no, ahead, no. please. I was going to say, you guys might be hearing this be like, wow, it's like sitting in class all day, right? Like you're just like listening to research and stuff like that. But 
I personally love going to conferences. I do a lot of bird conferences because that's what I study is birds. And one time we went to a museum, like there was an excursion as part of the conference. There was like a nighttime social hour at a museum where we got to go behind the scenes to their bird specimen collection. Um, and we got to see um, the dodo bird, a passenger pigeon and a um, Carolina parakeet, which are all extinct species as part of the conference. Like, so you can do like really, really cool things at conferences too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So just a few that we have listed here, um, you get a chance to showcase your projects and get feedback. So oftentimes, and depending upon the format of the conference and your particular presentation, there may be opportunities for question and answer, um, which will allow you to engage with your audience hear their ideas, get great suggestions and recommendations. Um, and as well, you can have conversations with other presenters and talk with them about their research as well. Um, and this goes back to what I said earlier about being able to develop and establish networks. It, I've made some amazing friendships um, with other colleagues whose research has been interesting. And so afterwards we just grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and we go and we chat about our interests and we find that we have so much in common. Those relationships have lasted over several years and through various projects. So um, that certainly is, I think, one of the great things. Another benefit of attending a conference is you get a chance to improve your presentation and public speaking skills. So I know many times I've heard a lot of students say that is the one thing that they least are looking forward to, or it's the one thing that could cause a bit of anxiety or nervousness. But I hope through today's workshop, you can see that the benefits by far can outweigh um, any potential uncertainty around public presentation and public speaking skills. It's something that can be developed over time. And this is a great place to start and to give it a try. Um, something else that could be useful to you as you think about benefits of an academic conference is, as you look ahead in your trajectory towards transfer, for example, it's a great opportunity to sort of build your resume and your repertoire as you think about what it would mean to be a potential um, a, a student or researcher at the next phase of your academic chapter. So um, this experience is certainly one that will build you and prepare you for next steps as well. So there's two major types of presentation styles, um, some of which you guys are already preparing. So you typically have a poster session, which is kind of what you see in this picture. You're presenting more or less one slide that has all your information on it. And then there's um, a paper or kind of, they're all oral presentations, but a paper or a traditional PowerPoint presentation, which we'll talk about soon. So with a poster session, you are designing a poster. This is not your elementary school. Let's get some poster board from, you know, Dollar Tree and like cut out the methods and things like, I mean, I don't want to say people would judge you if you did that, but they probably would. Um, a professional poster, you are usually using PowerPoint, but instead of working with a series of slides, you use one slide that then gets printed to be much larger. We're thinking about, you know, four feet by three feet, a pretty sizable um, poster. But it pretty much has, if you're writing a research paper, which most of you guys probably are, it's pretty much your research paper, but in a more condensed, more easily readable form. And when appropriate, using images um, to kind of help better illustrate a point. So this is still an oral presentation. You just don't put up your poster and be like, come check it out. Um, people are walking by. This is usually a huge session. We're talking 50 plus posters, usually in a huge hall or auditorium or depending on the space, this could be up and down hallways um, in an academic building. And so people are much more fluid. It's not like you present your poster once and then you're done. It's usually a two-ish hour event. You're typically at your poster the whole time and other people are kind of cycling through. And you're kind of, I don't know, I like to say you're selling yourself. Like if someone walks by, you shouldn't just be like, 
up. Like you want to actually actively engage people be like, Hey, you know, have, um, you heard about this new CRISPR technology, which hopefully they have, I mean, it's like life-changing, but have you heard about CRISPR or let me tell you about this gene, um, that we can edit using CRISPR and ways to essentially hook someone in. And you kind of use your poster as your guide. Like, you know, here's what we did. I'm um, here's some of our results. If you take a look at this graph, here's how we interpret it. This is much more casual. Most people sometimes find this intimidating. You're like, oh my God, I stand here for two hours. Like, how will I get people? Um, but it's usually a lot more relaxed. The poster sessions I've been to at conferences, there's typically food, there's typically alcohol, like people are just socializing, like walking poster to poster. Um, so it's usually a much more informal event even though you're presenting more formal research. Um, it's just a different style. Typically people who are presenting posters maybe haven't published their work yet um, or you know, found something, but it wasn't groundbreaking. They wanna tell people about it, but maybe it doesn't justify a longer oral presentation. Um, but it's, it's definitely a lot more relaxed, a lot less formal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would say, too, from a speaking perspective, I think the poster session presents its own opportunities and challenges. Um, when you think about, as Professor Nitoff said, having a hook or two prepared to invite um, an audience member, uh, a passerby to come over and take a look at your research, really requires some courage and a little bit of savvy and even creativity. You have to keep in mind, as Professor Nutoff said, there's so much happening oftentimes in a poster presentation room or setting. There's a lot of noise and interference that can interact or that can um, impede upon your ability to connect with others. So making sure that you're giving good eye contact to your audience members, you're asking them questions about their interests and finding ways to connect that back to your research. It's more of a back and forth. So when you're presenting your poster, you're using your poster as sort of your, your notes to keep track of and illustrate your research and your methods and your findings. But you're really focused on connecting with those who are coming around rather than reading a script or, you know, your, your direction isn't focused on your poster itself. It's open and focused on the audience that's in front of you. And so that can be a lot to, to balance, especially when you have audience members asking you questions off the cuff and making sure that you're responding to those answers to the best of your ability, being honest if you don't know the answer, but sharing the answer that you think based upon your research would best respond to their questions and then continuing the back and forth. So it can be exciting. It can be um, exhilarating, um, maybe even a little exhausting after a two hour session. But um, as Professor Nutoff said, a great chance to, to display and, and speak with others about your work. And this definitely is, this kind of session is where you're most likely to get feedback as well because it is a lot more informal and posters are more traditionally, maybe you're in the middle of this research or you're not ready to publish yet, you still essentially have a chance to add on to it or you know change different ways you've designed things or analyzed things. So you're more likely to get feedback too um, or ideas to kind of push your research further. Um, and sometimes that can be intimidating. You're like, oh my God, they just ripped my whole thing to shreds and like I'm worthless and I shouldn't even do science but it's really genuinely what the poster session is kind of about. This why it's very loud and honestly, it's just chaotic during a poster session. Now at MC, the poster sessions we've held, we're usually in rooms with no more than say 20 or so posters. So it doesn't get as crazy, but you guys go to a professional conference, it's it's overwhelming. <laughs> um, even just thinking about it now, I'm just like, <laughs> um, but it is really a lot of fun. So that might be a new presentation style for you. Even if you guys haven't presented in science before, you have probably at some point in your K through 12 or even here at MC have done what is usually referred to as a paper presentation where you've more or less, I also refer to these as PowerPoint presentations, though it's not necessarily PowerPoint. 
when we're saying paper is usually at a conference, you know, someone has published a paper, um, a scientific peer reviewed journal article, and they are now presenting that research paper, but in a presentation format. The length of these presentations at a conference varies from 15 minutes to hour long sessions. Um, they can be more round table, they can be more um, where you're at a long table and it's a panel discussion. So there's a lot of different formats of this. What you guys are most likely to see, what you're most likely to do, is you're standing in front of a group, you have your slides or visual aids, um, and you're speaking you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Um, and it really just depends on what you've signed up for or in the case of your classes what you're supposed to do um, and what you're getting graded on you want to go for it professor banks absolutely i think the paper presentation is one that um, as we say here it tends to be um, quite a bit more formal and i find that students often say that that's where they feel more uh, comfortable uh, beginning at conferences in the sense that you have your, your nuts and your bolts from your paper that may perhaps you've created an outline to discuss your most important points, but you do have the opportunity to have more notes in front of you to help you stay on track. But let me be clear, a, a, a paper presentation is not reading your paper to your audience. So from a communication perspective, one of the most significant and important things that effective speakers do is they find ways to engage their audience. Could you guys imagine if I read a 10 page paper to you during a, a presentation? Could, I don't think we'd make it through the first three minutes or two minutes. We wouldn't make it through the first minute probably. Oftentimes when we begin reading, several things happen within the speaking process. Our voice tends to change. So we lose some of that natural inflection and we often become more monotone. We direct our gaze, our attention downward at our notes or God forbid you're reading off of your phone or your, or your, your, direction is atten um, your attention is directed away from your audience. And what happens is your audience is no longer able to connect with you as a speaker or it becomes increasingly difficult for them to connect with your message. So one of the things that we really want to focus on is how is it can you, you know, deliver a paper during your paper presentation or even during the poster session? How can you effectively engage an audience with a dynamic delivery? So Professor Newtoff, let's move to the next slide and talk about how we can do that. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind when you think about presenting in front of others. Um, and one thing that I really want you to come away with is this idea of listenability. It's the idea that every word you say as a speaker is meant to be heard by your audience. So the words that you've written and prepared in your paper, in your essay, are words that are meant to be heard and understood by a reading audience who can go back and forth, they can engage with the text, they can reread a sentence, they can highlight and annotate. But an audience who's listening to you, they don't have the luxury of doing that. So everything that you say matters. Every pause that you take allows for your audience to understand and remember. It allows you to um, give, add emphasis or to assess your audience and say, hmm, is my audience laughing? Did they laugh at that joke? Do I see a lot of questions like them? Do I see my audience looks confused? So when we think about a public speaking um, opportunity at a conference, your job is to find ways to communicate your scientific message to your audience in a way that is listenable, understandable, and audience-centered. So we're going to get into the specifics of that a little bit more in a second, but we have a, a presentation example. This example is of a student's uh, uh, presentation at a conference, and for what it's worth, we're not, um, give it a view, and as you're watching, I just want you to think about, as an audience member, what did you remember? What do you understand? What do you think worked well? 
and perhaps what might you do differently as a speaker when you present at conference? And that's actually a really great point. Think about you guys see public speakers all the time, your teachers, right? And really pay attention. And honestly, the best way to improve your own skills is to just critique everyone else. Um, so if you're like, oh, they're never looking at me, I noticed that, or they're only looking at me, I also noticed that. Um, so what really helps you, you might feel bad, like, oh my God, I'm finding flaws in everything now, but that really helps you identify oh, I notice this when someone else does it, this should be something I avoid because I know it's noticeable. So when watching this, we're not watching all 19 minutes for anyone looking at the time on that. Um, we're gonna watch a couple minutes of this. Try to identify both strengths and weaknesses, things you wanna emulate and things that you'd want to correct. Um, I'm gonna start playing it. I think I've put all the settings correct. Feel free to throw in the chat. If you're like, it's too loud, it's too quiet, it's echoing, just let me know so I can change some settings around. All right, hello everybody. My name is Amon, and today I'm here to talk to you about my AP research project on brain scans, AI, and education. So the specific question that I'm gonna be answering today is to what extent can EEG and machine learning be used to predict the interest level of a given student, and EEG is just a brain scanning technique. But don't worry, we're going to get more into what everything in this means in just a second. So first, I'd like to talk to you about how I generally arrived at these sort of subjects that I'm studying. So in grade 11 AP seminar, uh, the two most important presentations for me, the two most important research projects, uh, were the one that I did on the efficacy of modern Western education and the one I did on the future of medicine itself. And so in the education topic, I was looking through the technological lens and what I found was that it seemed like we we're gonna have a lot of automation in the classroom. And this is because in the future, it seems like uh, machines are gonna be able to learn how our kids learn even better than we can. It's kind of an interesting concept. And the same thing uh, I found out in my uh, research into the future of medicine. So it seems like we're gonna have a lot of machine learning and a lot of AI in the medical field because these machines can actually uh, do these procedures and read these scans better than human doctors. And that was, that's what the sort of future holds in these areas. As well, I did a bunch of reading into brain-computer interfaces and the I.O. problem, it's called. So basically, the rate at which a computer can output information to us it has been pretty much fixed for quite a while. So we can like read information on the screen, and that's pretty close to the rate at which we can actually internalize information naturally. But the rate at which we can input information to a, into a computer has uh, had a bit more of a varied path and it's quite a bit slower in general than we're actually capable. So in the beginning, we had to like rewire a computer every time we wanted to input information. Then we got simple buttons, then keyboards, then mice, then smartphones. However, throughout this process, the maximum number of words per minute that we can enter into a computer has remained about like 200 if you're using a good uh, speech subsequent memory using EEG and machine learning. And the second paper that was pertinent is one that took it a step further. So this one, tried to use EEG and machine learning to make a computer program that would optimize a lesson plan for teaching people math using the EEG scan data. And so the important numbers from here are the 3.54 and the 3.45. So in the EEG-based learning environment where they were using the EEG and machine learning to try to optimize the lesson plan, the mean improvement from before and after on the math tests is 3.54. So that's how much they improved. Meanwhile, on the control group where they were just using a normal uh, computer program to teach them the mathematics, the mean improvement was only 3.45. So that shows that using the EEG scanner and using the machine learning algorithms, they were in fact able to make their lesson plans just a little bit better for those people so they could do better on the tests afterwards. I love how I pause it to let him finish his sentence. Not that I understand anything that he's saying. Um, so what we'll do, because I do you want to make sure everyone gets a chance to like actually like speak speak um we have an activity later that i don't think everyone will get to do so i kind of apologize i'm going to cold call some of you guys um so be prepared to unmute yourselves 
And all I'm asking is for you to share one thing. It can be any part of this presentation. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the words he's saying. It could be verbal, nonverbal. It can be visual. I want just one comment, whether positive, whether negative, about this student's presentation. So I'm going to kind of go in order of screens. Um, so I'll jump to you, Phoenix. Um, what is one thing, good or bad, that you notice about this presentation? Um, his like posture when talking was very confident. So it looked like he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. So I'm just curious. I'm going to follow up with that. What would like a poor posture look like? Um, like not having an open posture and maybe not looking at the audience as much. Yeah. Awesome. Totally agree. Uh, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, Sapand. Yes, so he, he was uh, confident and he had like uh, information and he knew all the information of the subject he was talking about, but uh, I feel like as a person who whose field of study is different and has no idea what he's talking about, um, a, a few jokes or a, like uh, a bit flexibility could have helped to get me interested in the, the subject he was talking about, which uh, he did and he just jumped right into the subject. Yeah, great. I'll actually, if you guys, all of you, um, oh God, I don't know where they are anymore, but either in the chat or I know there's a place you can share emoticons. Who here agrees with that, that you are, you are lost, you didn't really know what they were talking about and you wish that there was some sort of connection that you could make with it? And I got a thumbs up from Kira, a check mark from, yeah. So I'm seeing, yeah, lots of thumbs up, lots of check marks. Yeah. So I totally, even me who like I've done, I've been in an EEG and I'm just like, what are you talking about? So as a speaker, how do you build that bridge between your content and your audience? Some simple things that you can do is as you're preparing your presentation, ask yourself, how does this topic relate to my audience? In what ways or in their everyday lives? might they be impacted either directly or indirectly by the emerging technology or the, the specific uh, field or whatever it is you're researching. Ask yourself, is this, has this topic been discussed in popular culture? That doesn't mean that your speech or your presentation has to be only about its emergence in popular culture, but rather use that as sort of a hook, if you will, to draw the audience in to help them understand why it's important or why it's relevant. You can also talk about maybe there's a, a powerful statistic or um, something that, or a quote or something that you want to share that really captures the audience that makes them think and it compels the audience to reflect on how the topic might specifically impact them. That's a simple way that you can start to build that relationship to make your presentation more listenable. And some of you guys have have a, a not a struggle, but a barrier to overcome. I think I'm just everyone in Professor Gerardo's class, you know, your research is so cool, but I'm just like, okay, there's CRISPR and there's GAS9 and there's like all these acronyms and shorthands for things. And for people who are not in that field, I'm like, I know what you're saying is really cool and really smart, but I don't, I have forgotten what YAS49 means at this point. And so for some of you guys, this will be a larger barrier you have to cross than others. Um, and so that's something just to keep in mind. Um, it's not, unfortunately, not all subjects are as easy to digest um, as others. So I'm going to jump to you, Daniel. What was something else you noticed about the speaker? Oh. You are unmuted, but I can't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so I liked how he explained the diagram using his hands and how it was related to his projects instead of just showing the visual and just continu continuing on with his speech. I'm glad you point was anyone else like when he showed that table which has like 30 numbers in it I was like I swear if you don't point to the numbers I need I'm going to cry <laughs> like um, and that's really important for you guys too if you're using anything that has text or numbers in it it should be for a reason and don't let the 
the the viewers have to guess as to what's the most important thing visuals like that are really important especially because he's showing hey here's some research that's happened but if I have to guess what those numbers mean, it's not effective. Absolutely. From a, a presentation perspective, I think if you have an opportunity to use a pointer, um, which are like one of those little red lights, sometimes they present or offer them to you at conferences. That's a great way to um, help your audience see exactly where you want them to focus on that on your screen. But another thing to keep in mind is um, it's important not to show a large chart like that, just for the sake of doing so. Really effective speakers know how to take that specific number or the specific data that you want the audience to focus on and they, they wrap it in flesh. So you tell us, tell us what the numbers are and then you tell us what it means and why it's important. So then that, that chart or that image or that number has greater significance that makes the meaning of your message even more impactful for your audience. So um, another thing that I'll say as well is when you're presenting, making sure that it's okay to position your body so that you're looking at the, the screen behind you, but make sure that you don't turn your back completely to the audience. You wanna make sure that you keep yourself open and engaged to the audience at all times. So it's really easy to just wanna turn around, um, but that can, in an in-person uh, presentation, but that can also be distracting uh, to your audience as well. I'm sorry, I'm getting our, our next thing um, ready. Um, oh, sorry, 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 right, oh, stop, 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 stop. Is, um, okay. um, I'm just getting our next activity ready, which um, is a short speaking exercise. Um, what Professor Banks and I will do, actually Professor Banks, should we very quickly show what the different styles are that might pop up? What do you think? Sure, yeah, okay. let's. Okay. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to be direct messaging um, some of you guys a passage that I stole out of our biology textbook. And we're going to have a word that's popped up on the screen. And that's how you need to read. And it's okay to just straight up read this. Read this in that style so that you can really emphasize like this is what you mean. So we're just going to go through the words very quickly just so you have an idea like what's that word even mean? Or like, what does that mean when presenting? Um, so I'll flip through the slides, but I'll let Professor Banks um, kind of quickly just share um, what it is we mean when we are talking about that. So our first one, there you go. It, okay, okay, so something that you should keep in mind when you're presenting at conference is that there's many different ways to share your message with an audience. Typically, when you're speaking to an audience, you want to make sure that you're talking about your subject matter with um, confidence, with a level of enthusiasm, so that you can engage them throughout the entirety of your message. Oftentimes, that's difficult to do because we get caught up in trying to get out our message and keeping track of time and all the other things that we have to do. But if we are careful, we can make sure that we um, uh, more effectively uh, um, deliver our message to our audience as best as possible. So for those who didn't catch that, Professor Banks was speaking very monotone there. Um, no inflection, no nothing. Beautiful. Here's the next one. This was a little hard in a virtual environment, but I think it's even more important in a virtual environment. So in a virtual environment, what I suggest is that, and I have one on my computer, if you're presenting virtually, have a marker. Put that marker directly above your camera lens. And when you do that, what your virtual audience sees is the difference between this. At this moment, I'm looking at my screen. I see Phoenix, I see Sapan, I see Isabella, I see Kira. Hello, everyone. I'm sharing my message with you, and I'm looking at you as if we're having a conversation. But what you see is me looking down at you, rather than if I were to look up at my marker on top of my camera. Now I give the appearance as if I'm looking directly at the audience, but I still have the luxury of glancing down and looking so that I can still engage with Chen. And I can still see uh, Inchi, did I pronounce your name correctly? And I can still see Professor Dong and Professor Gerada. So when you think about three second eye contact, do your best to look just above your camera and then glance down at your screen so that you can assess your audience's feedback. 
try to hold it for about three seconds. In an in-person environment, your goal is to have eye contact that is panoramic, which means it expands across the room and you're engaging your audience members for about three seconds um, as a way to build a relationship with them and the content. Um, so question inflection is when you're speaking with others, but every sentence that you state ends with a question. So in your research, if you find that you're speaking, but at the end of your sentence, you end with a question, then it can become distracting to your audience because they may not know when you're making a point or when you are actually asking a question because the whole time it sounds like a question. Do you know your own <laughs> research? Or sometimes you can be so excited about your message that your nonverbal and your verbal delivery together can be a little bit overwhelming to your audience. So when we get excited, we tend to speak very fast. And as a result, our, the audience typically can't hear everything that you wanna say, or they miss really important points. Or when we get super excited over an extended period of time, that can become exhausting to your audience because they can't take in all of that energy. So anyone who's taken my class, they know exactly what that's like. <laughs> I'm going to do my best on this. Okay, so sometimes when we're nervous, we tend to speak really fast. Why? Because we just want to get through the presentation so we can sit down in our chair and we can be done. You can get in your car later on, drive away and say, I never have to do that again. But if you speak too fast, what happens? Oftentimes we have to, we stumble, we forget important things that we want to say. Our audience is looking at us like they don't, they didn't hear what we have to say pointing situation regardless. So instead of speaking faster, I recommend that you breathe. Sometimes using a pause or silence can be a powerful way of making sure that a message resonates. Drink water, always have water with you. The easiest way to make a pause is be like, I'm thirsty right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And being okay and comfortable in that silence. This is your research. Take a breath. Let people take it in. And I think that was the, yeah, so that was the last one. So I, so much. Um, so you guys did an awesome job. And hopefully by doing both good and bad things, you kind of become more aware how you word things. Not even how you word things. You guys all read the same exact passage over and over again, but small ways you affect your tone, the speed at which you talk gives very different impressions, not just to your audience, but also like how you feel about it. When you speak monotone, not only will that bore your audience, like doesn't that bore you as well? Like you're like, ah, this is like so not exciting. Um, if you're not passionate about something or excited about something, why in the world should anyone else be? Something I'll also add to that is this, the excerpt that we've read here in uh, the chat is not something you would present at conference. That, that this message was presented or prepared for a reading audience. And I've read it about 10 times now, and I'm still not quite sure what I'm reading. <laughs> So imagine how a listening audience would feel. So when you're preparing your message for your listening audience, what you want to think about is, what do I think my audience already knows or understands about the topic? What language or technical jargon is appropriate? And how can I say this in the most normal and digestible way? So it should feel good. The word should feel good coming from your mouth. And if they do, they're more likely to land softly on your audience's ears as well. So this particular excerpt would not, I don't, uh, would probably not resonate as well with an audience as if you were to say it in a way that is more um, just everyday talk. You can still exude confidence. That doesn't make you appear less intelligent. Actually, to talk about complex and technical subject matter in a relatable way is more difficult than just saying things or, you know, throwing out jargon. 
at the same time. So you really want to practice, 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 grab a friend, a roommate, a family member, and, and get used to talking about your research in a way that's relatable um, for others to understand. And I know not everyone got a chance um, to speak out loud um, today, but I would, I love this exercise because it's not related to your research, right? This is really just helping you form how you speak. And then once you feel confident that you are speaking in a tone you like, at a speed you like, then bring in the added skill of talking about what it is you want to talk about. Um, so this is a, like literally just flip open any book. Um, and this is something that you can easily do with others. Now we only have about eight minutes left. So this was just kind of a, a reflection, but hopefully you guys were kind of reflecting throughout the exercise um, on things that were effective and things that weren't effective, as well as things that maybe you want to reflect on how you wish to improve or that you wish to watch out for because you think you're um, susceptible to that. Um, I'm susceptible to being excited all the time, always. Um, so I usually have to tone it down. I usually take the exclamation points out of my emails. Like it's, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so we want to leave you guys with some final tips. So as Professor Banks just said, practice, practice, practice. Um, just, but, but don't practice too much. There becomes a line where you start memorizing. And like reading, memorizing can also have that same effect of it sounds recited. You, you lose your inflections, you lose your excitedness because it's almost like you're reading, but the script in your head. Um, so just be wary of that. I, I don't see that as often, but I do see it. Um, so just careful with the overpractice. Yeah, I think it can be helpful. Um, I like old school note cards, like the little four by four cards. And I'll put down like keywords and key phrases that I want to make sure that I'm addressing. But you all have done the research. You know more than anyone else in the audience about what you have done. So lean on that. And, and in that way, if you need to look at your notes to help you stay on track, especially during a, you know, a paper presentation, you'll have your paper, but you'll get lost if you try to read word for word. So just having those keywords and key phrases will help you stay on track. And remember, communication, public speaking, that's a skill. It's kind of like learning to ride a bike or, or learning a new um, to acquire a new talent. or It's something that you develop over time. And it's okay to be nervous. It's okay to stumble at the beginning. But as you continue to practice and put yourself out there, you'll see, you know, your confidence build. And don't, and this is one of the ones further down, don't apologize if you stumble or you miss something. Um, you should only be saying sorry in a presentation if you're talking about Canadians. Like there's no reason to be saying sorry. Um, it's, everyone gets nervous. It's totally fine. It becomes more noticeable if you're saying, hey, I'm sorry for stumbling. Most of us probably didn't even notice it or mm -hmm. we're so used to it that it didn't really matter. Um, so don't, don't put attention on something you don't want attention on. If you're stuttering a lot, don't be like, Oh, sorry, I'm stuttering a lot. I'm like, Oh, you, you are stuttering a lot. Like don't bring attention to something you don't want attention to. Um, stay within the time limit. It's, you know, you I really want to mold you guys now because you get to our age and I know all the professors in here have seen this where it's a 20 minute presentation and 50 minutes later, they're still going. Do not be that person. <laughs> this is where the practice comes in because those people exist. Um, same with speaking under time. I don't think anyone's going to get mad at you for speaking under time, but don't make it awkward. Just be like, all right, I'm done. Leave open it up for questions, open it up for a discussion, um, really take advantage of that time, use that time for feedback for others. Um, checking the room beforehand, sometimes you don't get this opportunity, but if you do, if you're able to like, let's make sure my thumb drive works, let's make sure I can copy and paste into Zoom. Um, these are things good to check beforehand so that you don't have any hiccups during that 15 minute slot you have. Some conferences, 
you know, your 15 minutes is up, they'll stand up middle of your presentation and essentially like unplug your PowerPoint and start the next person. Um, I've been to one conference like that and I loved it. Um, but it, um, <laughs> you don't want to waste your time, especially if you're in one of those more strict places where they just stay on time regardless of what's going on. Professor Banks, you have others that you want to just, just one thing that I, I want to zero in on is dressing appropriately. So we are always sending messages. We are always communicating to others. Others are receiving input from us and they are interpreting that. Our nonverbal communication also includes what we wear. So when we say dress appropriately, what we're saying is if you wear something that makes you feel confident, something that you don't have to like tug at or something that doesn't, I don't know, it's too hot or it's, wear something that makes you feel powerful and it makes you feel strong. The reason that that's important is because if you feel strong with what you're wearing, you're gonna communicate that through your nonverbal um, delivery. You're gonna open your, you're gonna be more likely to open yourself up if you're in comfortable shoes, if you're in a shirt that allows you to breathe and move around. Um, whereas if you wear something that you don't feel comfortable or powerful in, you might be more likely to um, close yourself off or that may come across in another way. Uh, maybe you, you're gonna be more likely to tug or to pull at something. So always think about what messages could I potentially be sending through my clothing and thinking about how that could impact your audience's ability to receive your message. That doesn't mean that you have to wear like a three-piece suit with a cummerbund and bows. Not that anybody wears that to a conference, but I'm sure somebody does at some kind. My point is, if you, are, if you wear something that makes you feel powerful, that will come out in your message too. Yeah, but also keeping it professional. Like if you're like, don't be like, oh, I'm comfortable in sweats. I swear to God, if you guys are wearing sweats at a conference, um, because as Professor Banks said, I mean, you want to be comfortable. If you are in uncomfortable shoes at a conference that is all day long, that's going to be noticeable. Um, but don't get too comfortable mm -hmm. um, because you may be meeting future employers. Um, if you guys are thinking about graduate school, you might be meeting you know, future advisors. Um, networking becomes a lot easier. Um, when you are on the more professional side versus the more casual side. Um, so it's something to keep in mind um, as well. It's a nice balance like right now. And also keep in mind your audience. You guys see me from my shoulders. I'm not wearing real pants right now. Like no <laughs> one knows that. Um, so, but in a real life setting, I would be wearing pants. So just keep in mind your type of settings um, and the kind of wear that goes with that. I think that covers all of all of our um, points. So for our last, um, I know we've got a minute left, but for anyone who wanted to stick around, um, if anyone had any questions, I mean, Professor Banks, you know, works in communications. She's been teaching this and working in the field for a long time. Um, I myself have presented at dozens of conferences. Um, so we're happy to share other insights. I do want to thank you all for joining Professors Dong and Gerada. Also, thank you guys for coming as well. Um, so I'll end up with a thank you and opening it up for questions. I had a question about um, using first person, like how much are we allowed to use it? How much should we be using it? It's a good, yeah, so when writing, right, it's almost like I did nothing. It was all passive tense. You really shouldn't be using that. In a presentation, it honestly would be weird if you didn't use first person. Um, so a presentation, it is almost expected to use I and we, because the way you talk, as Professor Banks was saying earlier, the way we write is not necessarily the way we speak, um, and it's okay. Um, professors Gerada and Dong, you can kind of correct me with that, but I feel like when it comes to oral presentations, that kind of passive voice doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. So use that yeah, I. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, for, for most of you, as you do your presentations, right, um, you would probably be using we more often than I, since I'm, you know, I'm thinking most of your work is either, right, in conjunction with a partner student or with your faculty mentor, right, like, 
I, I'm guessing most of you are not just doing things all by yourself. So probably most often you would be using, we did this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unless there were very specific situations where maybe you and your partner had individual tasks and there was some reason in the presentation that makes sense for you to you know, separate that out, right? Like I looked at this part and my partner looked at this part and this is how we put it together, right? That might be a situation where you could talk about I a little bit more. Yeah, and feel free to use people's names, especially if you're presenting with two people. So for example, Professor Banks and I are referring to each other to kind of help with those transitions when people should talk, things like that. And you guys as our audience see the other presenter. Now, Inshi, if you're presenting and you're working with Bob, but Bob's not part of the presentation, you referring to Bob would be weird. But yeah, my colleague, my peer, we, things like that, um, totally acceptable. Um, totally fine. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or tips needed? All right. Well, thank you guys again. Um, I'll see some of you guys next week because um, we'll be doing some presentations um, where hopefully you guys get to practice some of these skills and see you guys in the fall. Thank you guys again so much for coming out. Good luck with the fin finishing of your summer semester and good luck in fall as well. Thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.